There's your tea. Wow, this is hot. Hang on. Ah! <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Okay. I'll go again. Sure. <laughs> I'm tough. I'm Palestinian. Exactly. <laughs> I grew up in Belgium. I'm American, right? I have, I have so a hyphen. Tout à fait. Okay. Tout à fait, bien sûr. We have on va parler français, on va les laisser tranquilles, ils vont parler en anglais et Super. en français. Super, alors aussi, okay. je, je parle français. Ah, alors voilà, voilà, voilà. Oh, alors pardon, Anna, pardon. You're out. Exactly. Always But, a dream uh, of mine to learn French, so there I'll you. get started now. There you go. But I think we have a hyphenated identity, right? I'm a man, I'm a rabbi, I'm a father, I'm a Belgian, I'm an American. And I don't live in one of these pieces. I live in the hyphenated, in the spaces in between. It's interesting because sometimes when I tell people of my identity, it sounds very confusing to them, both because I'm Arab and Jewish, but also be, they're like, okay, well, how would a Persian man marry a Syrian woman? <laughs> like, my whole identity is just at the intersection of so many borderless identities. And for me, that is the Arabness. And I feel like my family really embodied that. We were, we were always mixing. My parents were very deliberate in, in making sure that I didn't know that I was Palestinian. It was because they didn't want me to live through the same pain, through the same trauma that they lived in. Right. Uh, they were Palestinian. My father was was internally displaced. And, and what that means, you know, it's a, it's a fancy word of, of way of saying that when he was nine years old, his entire village was erased. Trauma is cyclical, right? And when, when people experience trauma, they then internalize that trauma. And if there isn't sufficient healing, that trauma is then later passed Absolutely. on. Absolutely. And there's mm -hmm. a cycle yep. that in some ways is actually not personal at all to Israel-Palestine. It's a worldly thing. Right. And it was when I grew up that I realized that this was so much part of my identity, whether they tried to erase it or didn't try to erase it, because no matter how much they tried to erase it, there's still that trauma that is there. And that's why, for me, it's so important to continue to say that I'm from Palestine, right. I'm Palestinian, I'm part of the Arab nation. I thought that the episode did a good job at conveying something that I think a lot of people in this discussion miss, which is everything is very nuanced. And, and I thought that sort of like both this conversation with the Israeli woman, but also using his own privilege as an American, yes. right? And standing Absolutely. there while they were chasing the kids and all this, and I think, Look, I think as Americans or people who don't spend time in Israel or Palestine have a real great privilege of sort of like being kind of armchair arbitrators. It was really interesting for me to see how they weaved in so many elements of what it means to be a Palestinian there. Living behind the wall and the scarification that is done to the, to the landscape, how ugly it's made the landscape to uh, the idea of privilege and those who are privileged and those who are not. And so going back to the episode, you see that even um, privileged Rami, as he's going through the checkpoint, he can go through the checkpoint because he's an American. And then privileged Rami coming out of the checkpoint, he tells the, the soldier what happened with, with the bicycle that he stole. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, um, the response. And you see that automatic militarized response. And so for me, that was really important because that is what exactly what it's like to live in mm -hmm. Palestine. Mm -hmm. So it's a good read on the situation, basically. Yes. With humor. Sometimes that's all we're left with. Because if we really thought about it, we would break down and cry around everything that's going on. And I think that in that sense, shows like Rami and, and, and conversations like this can in fact um, bridge some of the gaps. Right. right? Because right, I, I can't take away the trauma. Right? And, and I, as a, as a spiritual leader, right, I, I often try to uh, make sure that I have a balance between looking backwards and looking forwards. So I, I'm much more interested in what we're going to do tomorrow than, than what we did to each other yesterday. Yeah, but you cannot move towards tomorrow without knowing what yesterday Abs was. Absolutely. And I think that that's why it actually, it's essential that we look at it from a decolonial perspective and not just about talking. Because the talking, I mean, my experience has been, is just it just circles. I think we really need to get this understanding that 
peace and justice are two different things. Agreed. And this is when we say, you know, the, the, the chant that we say on the street is no justice, no peace. It's not like some sort of threat. It's actually an, an, a reality, right? That if we don't have justice, we can't actually get to peace. So we need to start with talking about justice. The world is beginning to open its eyes and see that you can't continue to have a military occupation for over five decades of a people, and that people can't continue to be denied their freedom and, and languishing in refugee camps. That's slowly changing. It's not changing fast enough. This Western narrative that's constantly imposed on Israel-Palestine, like this is a, you know, millennial fight between Jews and Muslims, and they'll never get along. And it's it's not true. Like my family lived with Muslims. I, you know, I very much think that Palestinian liberation and Jewish liberation, they can both happen and they can coexist. This is not like a one or the other thing. What was the switch? Because mm. I grew up there. Yeah. And I grew up on the other side. I remember one time just waiting on a bus stop. And moments later, an older Palestinian man came. And I was kind of sitting in the only really available seat. And, you know, I was in a spiritual institute. And the spiritual institute teaches you that you honor elders. So I immediately just like got up and gave him the chair. And he was like so grateful for it. And it was this moment that really kind of... I just like looking at his eyes, there was something that clicked for me in that moment. And maybe there was a way that I saw his humanity or what he was working. Like he was just so surprised that I as a Jewish person would get up and give him this seat, which is such a small thing, really such a small thing. So I think that my commitment to also decondition my heart and to open my heart to the world's suffering, to the love of humanity um, and that had to include Palestinians. I mean, that had to include Palestinian suffering. And to me, that just feels really clear. Look, me and you are going to make it. Yes. Right? Inshallah. <laughs> there you go.